Okay. Well, good morning. Uh, since last time we were doing. Uh, uh, okay, so first of all, what we are doing uh, is uh, to study the <coughs> the properties uh, of the BC, the Bose Einstein condensate. Uh, we said last time that this this phenomenon is due to the following fact. Uh, when I, I have that the number of particles is conserved, I have an equation that relates the total number of particles, the particles that I can arrange in the continuum, and the particles in the um, uh, in the ground state. <coughs> From this equation, I see that. Uh, if, uh, for instance, I fix the number of particles in the volume, namely the density, and, in, and if I um, decrease the temperature, then at some point a phenomenon occurs, which is the condensation, uh, in which I have a microscopic occupation of uh, this, the, a single state, which is the ground state. And similarly, if I fix instead the temperature, and I change the number of particles, namely by changing the density. Indeed, this leads to a uh, curve uh, in the density temperature plane uh, that separates the normal phase in which everything is, the, uh, is uh, uh, in the continuum from the uh, BC phase uh, in which I have this occupation of the ground state, microscopic occupation of the ground state. Then we compute the equation of state, so the pressure versus density or pressure pressure versus specific volumes. And we said this <coughs> very similar to a first order phase transition. We have computed the Clapeyron equation associated to this phase transition, and the Latin teeth also, the particle. And now we were computing, uh, as a final characterization, we were computing uh, the uh, specific heat per particle. Well, better to say heat capacity per particle, specifically, usually is divided by the volume. So, heat capacity. And uh, I think we arrived at the following conclusion that uh, uh, below the C, um, the CB divided by NKB is equal to uh, is exactly the transition point so at c equal to one uh, this is 30 15 divided by four and then i have the ratio between these two both function computed it at one and we were also sketching the behavior of this quantity as a function of the temperature and we are here so here this dtc and this uh, uh, curve scales at t to the power of three half as we saw last time Power of three half, okay. which clearly indicates that the heat capacity uh, is zero. Well, it's going to zero as the temperature is lowered, as uh, opposite to the case uh, to the classical case in which you have a constant value, uh, which is three, three half, and that's it. Now we were computing the same quantity uh, for t. So this is uh, for T smaller than TC, and we were computing the same quantity for T larger than TC. And uh, uh, the calculation was a little bit tricky, and uh, it was a matter of computing uh, a derivative of the pressure with respect to the temperature, fixed volume, and uh, this is. Uh, uh, by half KB divided by lambda cubed, then we get this additional term KBT 
And once I have the derivative of the pressure with respect to the temperature due to the equation of state to get uh, um, uh, yeah to get the heat capacity of the particle, I need to multiply this by three uh, NKB. NKB times the derivative pressure with respect to time. Point. Okay, so now everything was to, to so the thing is now is to compute this derivative, and I think the last time we have started to do it, and in particular I have to use the chain rule to write the derivative with respect to temperature and the derivative of C with respect to temperature and the derivative of C. Uh, Yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, blah blah blah. And then I think that we arrived at this point. I do not repeat the calculations because they are the same as the last time. In particular, at some point we derived this that one over C derivative of C with respect to the temperature. Is equal to minus three half and lambda cubed divided by g one half of z. And here I have one over g minus three half and lambda cubed. That this was derived by using the relation and lambda cubed. Equal to g beyond and deriving this with respect to temperature. So now, since I have uh, uh, now this quantity that appears directly here, I, I have to use also the fact that when I do the derivative with respect to z of a, a g. So of a Bose function k or z, and I multiply by z, I get k minus one. So this relation can be uh, well, we saw it many times, and can be easily uh, derived. Okay. So. From here, it appears the G1 Okay, so now I have to put everything together. It's a matter of algebra. So. So now derivative of P with respect to temperature, fixed volume now is equal to I have Vb G I to C divided by lambda cubed. And then there is this additional term, which is three half, so I'm putting everything together, three half Kb and I have G3 on top of it divided by G1 on. That's it. Cinque mezzi KB meno tre mezzi KBN per la foto. But I have used the last relation, which was one over z derivative of z with respect to temperature. Okay. 
Um, now, once I have the derivative with respect to temperature, in order to get the heat capacity, as I wrote before, I need to multiply by 3 half mkb derivative of pressure with respect to temperature and volume. So I have to multiply this quantity by 3 half mkb, and therefore I will get uh, the first term, which is uh, equal to the one that we already obtained. And G by alpha Z. Apart from the fact that now I write n lambda cubed and I leave it like it is because uh, uh, instead in the previous case uh, I was putting n lambda cubed to G3 half of 1 because we are at the condensation point. Uh, then minus. I have this three half time three half, which is nine four. And the, uh, the density goes away, the KB goes away, and then I have just the ratio G three half. Okay. And that's it. So this is the heat capacity. The particle or T larger than TC. Whereas for T smaller than TC, the heat capacity per particle was basically just uh, the full term. No? I write T again. Uh, oh, oh, oh. That was a uh, uh, was the echo in the quantity. Mm -hmm. oh. okay. That's it. And in the comments, it we have this. Okay, so now I want to study the behavior of the heat capacity, in particular what happens at T equal to TC, where we have to already this limit. So this for T approaching TC from the left, I get that this N lambda cube is the G, uh, um, G3 half of 1, so it is by 15 divided by 4. And then I have the G5 R of 1 and G3 is the heat capacity of less than TC, as we wrote last time. And now, what happens when using this formula? Let's take A and compute it for T going to TC. From above. From above, I see that I get uh, uh, this is just uh, now z is equal to 1. So I have uh, the 15 divided by 4. Now here is the same as here. So I have the g5 half of 1 and the n lambda cubed. Again, is G3 alpha 1. And then I have minus 9 divided by 4, G3 alpha 1 divided by G1 alpha 1. And that's it. But now, 
we have to notice one thing that uh, this quantity actually is zero. Is zero or z or z one on the left because uh, g one alpha is divergent at z equal to one. Is uh, uh, indeed this G one alpha of Z is just the sum from L to one to plus infinity of Z to the power of L, and here we have L to the power of one alpha. And of course, this diverges at Z equal to one, no? it's divergent. Therefore, this goes to infinity and kills this quantity. Okay, so then we see that actually at t equal to t c, the heat, the heat capacity per particle is actually continuous. It has the same value, which is this one, uh, both from well, this one, from uh, above and from below the critical uh, the critical temperature. And actually, if you put the numbers, because now this level is just a matter of putting these numbers, uh, you, you get to 1.9 by using the uh, uh, some approximation for this formula for this Bose function. Okay. So CV divided by NQB is continuous, but actually there is a discontinuity. In the derivative. No? So when plotting the CV, I will do it in a moment, uh, we get actually a discontinuity that could be proven and making another derivative. But of course, already at this level, it was a little bit tricky. So I will not compute another derivative because it's a mess. Uh, but I mean, it's, uh, it's basically, uh, it's expected in the sense that here, the, the analytical expression of the CV are, uh, quite different because in one case, so in the other case, I have another, an additional term. So I will not expect to have uh, the same derivative. I have the same value because all the function is continuous because of the divergence, but then the derivative is different. Now what happens, and I will sketch in a moment the plot of the TC. What happens is that when, uh, um, when I am, when I go to large temperature, so for large values of T, uh, so for large values of T, what happens that Z zero, <clears throat> at fixed density, and uh, uh, well, if I take the expression of before, CV divided by NKB, uh, this was, uh, uh, let me take it again, and let me start our So this is 15 divided by 4 and round the cube to g by alpha z minus 9 divided by 4 g 3 
on J1 of OC. And we also know, and we also know that actually, the unlucky will be good. Is G3 half of Z of T larger than TC because I do not have this additional term uh, due to the condensate. And so basically, here this quantity is just 3 half of Z is 15 divided by 4 G by half of Z G3. Uh, of Z minus nine four G three and Z Now, in the case in which uh, T is large, Z is approaching zero. Well, actually, what happens here is that, is that uh, when solving the equation, uh, I think that well, this is the classical limit, no? So what happens here is that a fixed density, uh, T is large, but then the chemical potential um, gets uh, um, large and negative, and therefore the Z is approaching zero. Okay, so uh, how is approaching zero? Well, at the first, a reading, a reading order, we have seen already this, is the last order okay. so this was a series in which uh, I have the leading order Z and then I have all the other powers of Z okay. so is the, is the G3 alpha function and the same is true for G5 alpha and G1 alpha by looking at the same expression as before no? the as leading order I always have uh, when z is approaching zero for the first power of z. Therefore, all of these quantities scales as z as I'm approaching the, the classical limit. Okay, so they, they scale like z, and therefore they can actually cancel. So here, 15 divided by 4 minus 9 divided by Okay, which is three alpha. Even in the classical result. Okay. So we discover again the classical result also for the heat capacity, uh, which is the one uh, which is obtained when Z is uh, small. So now we can sketch the behavior of the heat capacity as a function of the temperature. So it behaves more or less qualitatively in this fashion. Temperature point is one point nine, and here this is increasing as a power of T to three alpha. Then it approaches this value, which is one point nine at the critical temperature. Then, as I said before, I have a discontinuity in the derivative that I'm not going to prove because it's a matter of making another derivative, so it's, it's a little bit messy. And then uh, I have for large temperature we will reach the asymptotically the value three half, which is the classical value. Okay. So this is the heat capacity of the boser of the of a gas of three bosons, okay? So I get the classical limit, which is correct. I get the fact that when T is approaching zero, I get the, the heat capacity is vanishingly small. 
and also you have a feature here which is a discontinuity of the heat capacity uh, which is related to the bose einstein condensate. Now I will make some other comments in order to, to conclude this part on the borderline and condensate. So the first thing that I want to notice is what happens to the entropy when T is going to zero. Of course, what is most mostly interesting in, this, in those cases of the quantum statistics are the, the different behavior at small temperature. So here we have found a phase transition, which is the bose einstein condensate. Now we ask ourselves what happens to the entropy uh, when T is approaching zero. Uh, in this regime, I cannot use the sacro tetrad formula because that formula was valid uh, in the classical case, namely when N lambda cube is much smaller than one, okay? which means uh, small density and or large temperature. So in this case, I cannot compute the entropy by using the sacro formula, but I have to rely on the results that we have. Well, actually, we have, we have not computed the entropy yet, but actually can be done easily because uh, I just need to remember that PB is equal to minus omega, the ground potential, and that the derivative of the ground potential with respect to the temperature, that fixed volume and fixed chemical potential, is equal to minus the entropy. Now the ground potential and the pressure are basically the same quantity when I fix the volume, uh, well, are proportional just the volume. So these scales, the entropy scales as minus, well, entropy scale and the derivative of the pressure. Because of this. Now, what is the behavior of the pressure uh, as a function of the temperature below Tc, so small temperature? So at small temperature, we derive this result P scales as a temperature to the power of five half. And we derive this result last time. And that means that the, the entropy scales as the power of uh, uh, t, t to the power of three half, no? Or small temperature. And therefore, the Okay. So these are. Uh, uh, for a boson, so for a gas of three boson, bosons, is the third principle of thermodynamics that we saw already once when, uh, I think, when uh, uh, introducing the density matrix. So for gas three bosons. The entropy is going to zero and the temperature is going to zero. It's third principle of zero. Okay. This is the first comment I want to do. Uh, then we, 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 I want to make some other uh, notes to complete 
the bosons and gas, uh, the boson gas. Uh, what I said last time is that uh, um, in the model we are considering, it's very simple in the sense that bosons are uh, point-like particles, For in the model we are considering, they do not have a finite volume, and also we are completely neglecting the interactions. Okay, of course this is very artificial, and uh, in reality, of course, uh, particles will have, will have a typical size, or if you want, they will, in any case, they will interact. Okay? So, when looking at real physical systems, uh, one, pro one phenomenon which is uh, related, or it's very similar uh, with, uh, to the Bose-Einstein condensate, is the phenomenon of superfluidity. Okay? So, this is a phenomenon. Similar to BC is what happens to helium four in his superfluid phase. And uh, one can sketch the phase diagram for helium-4, uh, which uh, looks like this pressure and temperature. So this is just to make a connection with the real physical systems, okay? So because what we have studied is a little bit academic, although qualitatively we can describe uh, interesting properties of this condensate, but actually real physical system situation is more complicated. So, uh, in the case of superfluid helium, a phase diagram look like this solid. Then we have here a line, which here are the gas, and here we have normal liquid or normal fluid, and here we have superfluid. And this line is called the lambda line. And it is a second order phase transition line. Lambda line, the second order phase transition. Well, I remind you that first order, second order uh, refers to the discontinuity of the uh, chemical potential derived with respect to pressure and temperature, or if you want the pressure derived with respect to chemical potential and temperature. When I have a uh, discontinuity of the first derivative, this is a first order phase transition. If I have discontinuity of the second derivative, it's a second order and so on and so forth. And uh, here we have uh, this point here is a two point of Kelvin. Uh, <clears throat> now, one thing that one can notice about the helium superfluid is that, uh, um, at least uh, in this uh, sketch of the phase diagram, <clears throat> uh, it can uh, uh, be solid only when the pressure is very large, actually. So I do not have, uh, uh, so it's different with respect to the uh, case of water, for instance, in which the phase diagram looks, uh, uh, looks quite different with respect to this one. And this is because uh, basically the, the helium-4 likes to be in a fluid state because the, basically it's like, uh, it cannot form easily a crystal, and the, so the atoms uh, in, a, in this lattice feel a potential that it's too, uh, too, too weak, and they actually they escape from the potential and behaves more like a fluid, unless the pressure is very large, and in that case I have a uh, solid, you know? Whereas for water, the 
the phase diagram it was something like this. Well, here I have the solid. So you can survive also small temperature or, or vanishing, vanishing pressure, whether it's in this case not. And this is due to the to the potential of interaction. Okay. Uh, good. So one thing that one can notice about helium, no, so the helium, no, and which uh, reminds us the BC is the following one helium for the boson gas. And becomes superfluid in certain condition, but uh, helium three does not make a superfluid. And this is a fermion gas. So the first thing that one can notice that is interesting is that uh, when uh, considering the same uh, species, uh, but two isotopes, uh, one which are bosons and the other one which are fermions, in one case there is a superfluidity phenomenon, whereas in the other case not. So that uh, somehow uh, uh, means that uh, uh, the statistics uh, um, is making a difference in these two cases, okay? And indeed, there is condensation in the boson gas, so there's no condensation in, the fermionic, in a fermionic gas, as we will see. Okay, so that makes a first comparison between superfluid and DC uh, interesting because uh, it, uh, it occurs for uh, the bosonic version of helium. And, uh, but there is another thing that we can do is to use our formula uh, to see which would be the critical temperature at a fixed density for the bosons and condensation of this gas, of this uh, material. And we will see that actually this number is very close to the real number, even using our simple formula. So, just an order of magnitude estimate. <clears throat> Let's try to do it. Now, uh, at some point, uh, we derived uh, an equation for the critical temperature as a function of the density. And maybe it's better that I write it down. That was uh, the equation uh, that we had when putting n lambda cubed is equal to C3 alpha 1. And so KBTC was equal to H cubed density time divided by C3 alpha one. This is the power of two children. And then we have one over two pi. And it was derived. Uh, last time, do I to stop? Okay. Um, so it's, it's by fix the, the density, uh, is the critical temperature and the critical density. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so now this is equal to uh, let me work uh, in, uh, well, first of all, let me introduce uh, a factor of, uh, uh, so the H bar, so this is uh, H bar times two pi and N divided by G3 R one to the power of two thirds. And there you have one over two pi Okay. Uh, 
vediamo se mi sopravvivono un po' di... Ah, ok, questo è il tappano So I have a 2 pi cubed, 2 pi squared, so there should be a 2 pi in the numerator. And then, yeah, the mass. Now, let me work in natural units. H bar is equal to 1, or the KB is equal to 1, and the TC uh, should be uh, now H bar is equal to 0, uh, so it's n to the power of 2 thirds divided by G3 half of 1 power of 2 thirds and 1 divided by 1. Here we have a 2 pi divided by n in natural units. And let me check if it's correct, yes. So now let me put here the mass. So we are studying helium-4. Let me put just to make an order of magnitude estimate for TV. And the density, the, the number density, which actually I think is correct. If I take it from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, the real density of U4, a uh, small temperature. And this is uh, uh, 2, 10 to 22 divided by centimeter cube. Okay. okay, so now it's a matter of doing the calculation. So these are 2, 10 to 22 particles. Uh, then I we have to translate centimeter into Fermi, and I should get uh, 2 to minus 17 Fermi cubed. Right. The, uh, one centimeter is uh, 10 to uh, um, 30, uh, 13 Fermi. Penso che si sia uguale a 39, ok, 2 per 19, So now uh, let me uh, consider this. So this uh, dance is the power of 3, 2 thirds. Uh, when making uh, two thirds of this, uh, I have uh, uh, Fermi the power of two. Therefore, to get the right number, I should multiply this one by h bar t squared. In this case, I get the, the correct dimension in the sense that the mass is in GB. This h bar t is 200 MeV per Fermi. And therefore, I get uh, uh, an energy squared here and an energy in the denominator, Fermi squared here, and the Fermi squared in the denominator coming from that. Okay, this should be correct. And I just need to put uh, uh, instead of M, I put here for GB. And if you do the calculation, I do it in natural units because I'm used to do it uh, in natural units, but you can use another system. And uh, we get that TC is a close order of two Kelvin. Well, actually, with these numbers here, let me write the correct result is a 2.4 uh, 10 to the minus 10 MeV which is almost equal to 2.4 Kelvin, okay? And the number that we had in the lambda line, uh, 
for the separation between the superfluid and non-superfluid was 2.2. Mm? So it's very close to this one. Very close. So therefore, superfluidity, the Bose-Einstein condensation, share some share some similarities. Okay, although uh, in the way we we were doing the Bose-Einstein condensation, there's no interaction, so it's a, it's a little bit uh, artificial. Now, the properties of superfluid are so many that uh, I'm not going here to discuss because it's another real topic of statistical mechanics, the properties of having uh, vanishingly uh, small uh, viscosity uh, and so many, and many other properties. Uh, I will discuss instead uh, uh, two more facts about uh, and both Einstein condensation. Well, maybe, maybe let me make another comment on this. So, in the superfluid helium, this is a phase that is present in the phase diagram already. Uh, and we said it's somehow connected with Bose-Einstein condensation. Actually, the Bose-Einstein condensation has been found experimentally for, for real bosonic and interacting gas, and there were some Nobel prizes for that. But to, to, to obtain the Bose-Einstein condensation is very difficult from an experimental point of view. Okay, so it's not a, not a trivial task. Uh, but it exists and it has been proven also for real system in presence of interactions. Okay. Now, to well, another thing that I wanted to do and to make a comment on was uh, that for uh, BC in presence of interaction. real systems actually we do not find a first order phase transition but a second order phase transition okay. and another factor which has uh, uh, which is remarkable is the fact that uh, the, even the the uh, the heat capacity has a divergence. But I just need to is just for the sake of being uh, more related, so closer to the real physical uh, system. Okay, so. Uh, the features in real system are a little bit different with respect to what we found in the simple non-interacting boson gas. Okay. Two more comments, and then I think it's really over. Uh, the first thing is the following. Is there B, C in two dimensions? So if we were in a world with, uh, instead of three spa spatial dimension, uh, we were in two dimension, is, uh, again, there is again a BC, where the answer is not. And this is interesting because the uh, occurrence of phase transition depends also on the dimensionality of the system. So if we are in two dimension, three dimension, or several dimensions. And the reason is actually is simple, and that's why I'm telling you this. Uh, and it is the following. Now, at some point, uh, we, well, the starting point for the positive and condensate was the following. M lambda cubed is equal to G3R of Z 
plus the term corresponding to the uh, ground state occupation. So the lambda cube divided by the volume and C1 minus D that was interpreted as N0 to so the number of particles in the ground state. Since this function here is limited and uh, is equal to a certain number at Z equal to one, once I fix uh, N lambda cubed, if this n lambda cube is larger than this number, I will have definitely a large, well, a microscopic occupation number of the ground state, which is n zero. Okay. So the phenomenon of, cond of condensation is due to this basically to, to the fact that this function here is limited, and so if I introduce at fixed temperature more particles, or if I decrease the temperature at fixed number of particles, then I have to populate the ground state in a microscopic way. Now, what happens is that when I, I am in, instead of three dimensions, suppose that we are in two dimensions. Well, in two dimensions, uh, we can write an equation for the number of particles uh, as follows. So this will be N0, which is again the contribution of the ground state population. Then I have the continuum, but now the continuum is a little bit different because the integral must be done in two dimensions instead of three dimensions. So the continuum will be something like this, one over two pi squared instead of three because we are in two dimensions. Then there is a, here in three dimensions, we get the volume. Here we get the surface, which is an L squared. And then I have the integral, which is the spherical coordinates, but in two dimensions means polar coordinates. So I have a two pi here, zero plus infinity. Here instead of d3q, I will, I will have a d2q, which is a dq or dk, and then I have a power of q in two dimensions. Then I have uh, uh, D minus one, D two epsilon Q beta. Minus one here. What is the difference? And the only difference with respect to the previous case uh, is that here I have a power of Q instead of having a power of, power of Q squared. Okay. Now this is equal to N0 plus some coefficient that I write writing as A, which is a number. And then I have an integral from 0 to plus infinity that's working the variable X where x was, uh, um, uh, well, x is proportional to q. So here I have an x here, and here I have something like z minus one x squared. Where x is proportional to q. <clears throat> Now you see here, well, actually here, okay, there is a constant, but there is a temperature of which is important, okay? We can compare this equation with the, with the equation that we derived for the, for the bosons in three dimensions. <clears throat> blah, blah, blah. Just a moment. Should be a temperature there, no? Non posso non essere nell'altro. 
I will check it, but it should be a temperature. Maybe I have to check one moment and do it uh, the power of this temperature. Um, now you see that here, when z is approaching one, I have uh, uh, that this behaves uh, for x small as uh, x squared, and there would be x here. Since I, I, I'm integrating from zero to plus infinity, I have a logarithm divergence. So now this integral here, it has a logarithmic divergence. Because uh, for small x, as I said before, this will behave as one, one, as one over x. When I integrating, I have a log. Okay, so there is a logarithmic divergence that was not present in the case of three dimensions, because in three dimension here we have x to the power of two, and therefore this function here it is a finite, so it's like x is small x. Okay. Now, since I have a logarithmic divergence here, uh, when setting n, fixing n, in any case, uh, I can arrange my particles in the continuum because actually this is divergent. So I do not need to populate n zero. So I can do with this function here whatever I want. It's not limited as g3 out of z as the last case. This one, this was limited, whereas this is divergent, okay, when z is approaching one. Therefore, there's no need, if you want, of occupying the ground state in a microscopic way. So n0 will be vanishing in this mode, and I will arrange all the particles in the continuum, because in any case, this function is not limited. So that means that the Bose-Einstein condensation cannot occur here unless, uh, but unless the temperature is small or zero. So no BC unless T is equal to zero. Because if t is equal to zero, then of course this term will disappear, and we will have that the number of particles uh, must be equal to the number of particles in the ground state. Okay. So t c equal to zero is not interesting. It's like saying that there is a phase transition at zero temperature, but this is not a phase transition because in any case I cannot reach t equal to zero. Okay. So no phase transition. No. BC in two dimensions. And this uh, fact is uh, uh, interesting, and uh, it is seen also in uh, uh, also experiment, well, numerical example of uh, uh, studies on phase transition, which the, the occurrence of phase transition depends on the dimensionality of the system. Okay. I will check in a moment this power here. Let me uh, make another let me make another observation. Uh, which is the following. Um, Photons. Do photon photons uh, uh, this show or feature uh, Bose Einstein condensate? Is another question we can try to answer. And they, they well, uh, the answer, and at least by looking at, let's say, Textbooks is no, but for some experiments that were done in the in the line very recently, in which the 
experimental setup is very complicated and there is a sort of conservation of the number of photons. But in principle, uh, uh, photons do not condense because there is no conservation of photon number. So there's no, there's no uh, law in, in nature that tells me that the number of photons is conserved, okay? And there's no something like lepton number conservation or baryon number conservation, okay? That is something that at the end I'm using when treating a gas of bosons make, made of atoms. So in that case, I'm conserving the number of particles because at the end they are, uh, they are uh, making they are made of baryons okay and leptons but in this case in the case of photons uh, there's no such a low conservation therefore if i work uh, at uh, uh, working at fixed pressure and temperature the Gibbs free energy, well, the variation of the Gibbs free energy, dg, which is equal to mu dn, and this must be zero uh, at equilibrium. But since uh, dn is actually can be different in zero, because there is no conservation of photons. So, So in normal thermodynamical conditions, uh, at the equilibrium, mu dn must be equal to zero. And therefore, since dn can be different from zero, that means the mu can be equal to zero. Okay. And indeed, all the thermodynamics of photons depends, as you might remember, just on the temperature. There's no chemical potential that one has ever used for photons. The only quantity that appears that regulates the pressure, the intensity, the energy density is just the, the scale of the temperature. There's no chemical potential for this. Okay? So, uh, in this, therefore, in the case of photons, there is no, uh, there is no condensation. Okay. Unless one uh, somehow devises an experimental situation for which the end is conserved also for the number of photons. But usually this is not the case. So when I decrease the temperature, I just remove photons, they disappear, and that's it. Okay, so let's stop for a break. And I want to check on one thing. Because I'm not sure about this power of T there.
Okay, let's start again. So I had a doubt before, but actually it was correct. So if I take this, uh, this formula, which was the occupation of the continuum, and I make uh, uh, this uh, um, substitution, so x squared is equal to beta h squared squared by, by 2m. So I see from here that x scales as 1 over the square root of t. And therefore, since I have here 2 power of q, so q to the power of 2, basically, I will have x to the power of 2, and therefore 2 square root of t. So the scaling is correct. So this uh, this uh, uh, is integral times the temperature. OK, so it's fine. It's fine. It was OK. And indeed, uh, actually, one can also make it in the following way. Uh, in three dimension, uh, n lambda cubed was equal to this integral, to this one, and lambda scales as uh, t to the power of minus 3 half. Therefore, uh, I have that n must scale as t to the power of 3 half times this integral in three dimensions. In two dimensions, instead of having three times one half, I have twice one half, which is one. And that was important, uh, now that you have to see that only in the case in which the temperature is equal to zero, then I can have a microscopic occupation of the ground state. In the other case, it's going to be not And therefore, have no problems with arranging particles. Okay. So that's all for what concerns uh, the boson <coughs> gas. Now we will do the the Fermi gas, case of three fermions. And uh, well, the starting point is always the same. As for the boson, so we derived at some point the grand canonical partition function. That in the case of fermions was the following: the, the discrete, uh, so in the, the discrete spectrum of Q uh, was one plus the exponential of uh, beta mu minus epsilon Q. <coughs> Well, which is also equal to product over Q of one plus this Z e to the minus beta epsilon Q. And uh, uh, this is the grand canonical partition function. And the relations that are, are important is that are the equation of state relation. Tb divided by Kbt is the log of the grand canonical partition function. And there is this additional equation that in n, it was actually the average of particle n in the grand canonical ensemble is a d derivative with respect to, with respect to the log of the grand canonical partition function. Okay. So now, when doing the log of this product, the log of the, of the product becomes the sum of the log, and uh, uh, the sum of the log will become an integral. No? So first, I will have one. Sum over Q of the log of one plus Z minus beta epsilon Q. And when doing the continual limit, uh, this sum will become integral. So the log of the grand canonical partition function 
will, be, will become uh, the usual integral, which is volume divided by 2 pi cubed. And I have to integrate over the Q. So P3 Q, or I don't remember the notation that I had used to that point. P3 Q means that. Yeah. P3 Q. And here I have the log of 1 plus Z is time. <clears throat> Once I have the log of the grand canonical partition function, which is this quantity, then I can compute, uh, for instance, the number of particles n. The calculations are really the same as the boson gas, but for the fact that there is a, um, uh, yeah, it's slightly different expression here. But one can do it uh, with the calculations. And uh, for instance, for the density, which is n divided by the volume, I get the results that you uh, know already, which is 1 over 2 pi cubed integral over d3 cubed. And here I have the <coughs> 1 e2. Uh, beta epsilon q z minus one plus one. Okay. From which, similar to the case of boson. You see that the number, uh, so the average number of particles in the level Q uh, scales as the Fermi Dirac distribution. So one e epsilon Q minus mu beta plus one, which is the Fermi Dirac distribution. No? Okay. Of course, this must be multiplied by uh, the differential, no? So this must be, so the real distribution is actually this guy here times uh, uh, D3Q, no? which, provide, which then integrated provides me the total number of particles. <clears throat> and this is the Fermi Dirac distribution. Uh, now, everything is very similar to the case of the Bose gas, so the boson gas. So I will not repeat all these calculations because they, they are basically the same. So in particular, at some point, uh, we uh, uh, derived an equation for n lambda cubed, which was equal to the integral that was the one the thing I was doing before also. And in this case, n lambda cubed is equal to the coefficients are basically the same, or over pi integral from zero to plus infinity in dx x squared exponential of x squared times z minus one and then plus one. Okay, so similar the case of the bottom and in the bottom case. But okay. so the steps are the same. And lambda cubed in the case of bottom has a minus here instead here you have a plus. And that's it. <clears throat> uh, 
And as in the case of bosons, we can do the following. We can write this as 4 square root of pi z. Then I have the integral from 0 to plus infinity dx of x squared. Here I have x squared e to the x squared plus z. Where I'm multiplying the numerator and denominator by z. Okay. And then I can expand in series. In series of z, so around the classical limit. So and then I will get 4 square root of pi z. And here we'll have a leading order. I have, uh, um, as before, uh, I have a uh, mm, square root of pi divided by 4, which exactly cancels with this. I just providing the classical solution. Uh, then I have a, a minus. Let me see this minus, where does it come from? It comes from the fact that I have to derive this quantity with respect to z. And so since z is in the denominator, I have a minus overall, a, a, a minus factor in front of everything, which is not compensated by the additional minus that I had in the case of bosons. So in this case, the derivatives, when computing the derivatives, I get several minus, whereas in the case of bosons, it was just plus always. So at first order in z, I have a minus, now z, and the integral z plus infinity of dx, x squared divided by e, x squared plus z. That must be computed for z equal to zero, plus all the other terms. Z and x x quadro for la Okay. So the only difference with respect to the case of uh, uh, bosons is now that they have a, a, a minus, and then I will have a plus, and then a minus again. Uh, so the series in Z is a little bit different. I can write the first terms, which are the following. So n lambda cubed is equal to Z, as in the case of bosons, which is the classical case, minus Z squared divided by 2 to the power of 3 half. Then I have a plus Z cubed. And here I have a 3 to the power of 3 half. Then I have minus blah, blah, blah. And this defines a function that is called f, the uh, function. Similar to the Bose function, which is just, a, which has just an additional minus one to the power of L that corrects the results that is uh, that is obtained in this case no so the fk of z is equal to the sum from L one to plus infinity of minus one to L plus one z to the power of L and L to the power of k So differently from the, the Bose function, here you have a minus one to the L plus one, which is correct because for L equal one, I get two for X is power one. So yeah, these are the Fermi functions. Uh, they have the similar properties concerning the derivatives. So if I do z derivative with respect to z of f of k of z, I guess, as in the case of Fermi of bosons, the fk minus 1 of z. 
And so now the two equations that we write are, as in the case of bosons, for I'm going and running because it's just the same, but for a minus. N on the cube is now this time f of three half of z, f three half of z. And similarly, p lambda cubed divided by kbt is equal to f five of, of z. It must be compute, compared with the case of bosons. So the only difference is that is that is, is that there had both a function whereas here I have uh, uh, 30 functions, okay? So for the rest, everything is, is the same. So I will not repeat the calculation just because it is the same. Now we can, as in the case of bosons, recover the classical limit and the first order correction to the classical limit, first order, uh, which actually corresponds to the second order in Z, So the classical limit as before is that uh, uh, n lambda cubed is equal to z and the p lambda cubed divided by kbt uh, is equal to z also. By combining these two, you see immediately the p divided by kbt must be equal to n, which is the classical equation of state for ideal gas. And then we go on and try to see which is the first order of correction. So let's start with n lambda cubed equal to z. Then the second term, when z is small, that I keep is z squared divided by two to the power of three half. Okay. And we proceed as in the case of bosons. So now from this equation, I derive that Z is equal to N lambda cubed plus Z squared divided by two to the power of three half. And and we substitute now in a inter so thinking about a sort of iteration, instead of Z, we put the leading order uh, estimate for Z, which was N lambda cubed. So it's N lambda cubed, therefore, it is N lambda cubed plus N lambda cubed squared divided by two power of the n. Okay. Now this is very similar to the case of of bosons. It's just a variable class here. So it's n on the cube that I can collect one plus n two. Now what they do is to take this function here of z. So this estimate of z at second order in n lambda cubed and substitute in the expression for the pressure. Because for the pressure, which is in here, I had the P lambda cubed divided by KBT is equal to Z leading term. Then I have a minus Z squared divided by two to the power of five half. plus other terms. And then what they do is to substitute, uh, instead of Z, I put this number here. Okay. <clears throat> so take this guy here and put it here. And get the following result. Here's one, one, one. 
so phi lambda cubed divided by kbt is equal to uh, n lambda cubed. And I have one plus n lambda cubed divided by two to the power of three half. And I have minus one divided by two to the power of five half and z squared, which means n lambda cubed times and I'm the cubed uh, squared and I have a one plus and I'm the cubed divided by two to the power of three half squared. Okay, so now it's a matter of making the algebra. Let me just check that I have all the terms. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So you do the algebra and you will get uh, n lambda cubed similar to the case of the bosons. So, therefore, I'm not repeating the calculations, just the same. And if you uh, stop at second order in n lambda cubed, lambda cubed, which is the small quantity in this case, you get n lambda cubed, one plus n lambda cubed. And here you have two to the power of five half. Okay. Therefore, the correction to the pressure is basically the same, but for a minus that we had in the case of the bottom. So therefore, P uh, lambda cube divided by KBT is equal to N lambda cube. And here is one plus N lambda cube by R. So by dropping this lambda cube, this lambda cube, I get, I get the classical result, which is P divided by KBT is equal to n plus the first order correction, which is uh, proportional to n lambda q divided by two to the power of two to the five half. Okay. Now, okay, of course, this is uh, effective propulsion. Why is propulsion? Because uh, it increases uh, the pressure of this gas. Uh, it holds true for fermions. Okay. In the case of bosons, we had a minus here, and in this case, we have a plus. So it's a, a larger. Uh, it has a larger pressure with respect to the classical case. Uh, okay. So here there's not much to do. Uh, now, this is the classical limit and the first, co first order correction uh, to the classical limit in the small n lambda cubed uh, case. No? Now we work in uh, uh, just the opposite direction and see what happens instead when the temperature is small and we will start with T exactly equal to zero and then we will move and see what happens when T is finite but small. So this is the classical limit. Now we work in the quantum regime where T is equal to zero. And then we will work also in the case uh, in the regime in which t is finite but close to zero. And we will see the sum of the expansion. Uh, yeah, so the starting points, I mean, on this fact, I'm going uh, maybe a little, I will go a little bit fast because you know these things because you have done it uh, many times. So I will not. Uh, uh, go into too much into the details because you know this already, okay? But the starting point is this one, and is equal to uh, 
1 over 2 pi squared. Here, in principle, we can put the g as a degeneracy factor. If, if, if I'm thinking about fermions, uh, we need to introduce a degeneracy because there should be a degeneracy. For the case of bosons, there could be a degeneracy, but there could also be spinless particles in that case. Uh, there could be scalars in that case, there is no degeneracy. But in principle, for fermions, I should introduce a degeneracy factor, which is G. And uh, then I have uh, an integral dpq of uh, 1 divided by uh, e to beta epsilon q minus 1. Okay. Now, this function here, you know the plot of this. Uh, uh, is something like this. And uh, <clears throat> um, what happens when B, when T is equal to zero? Uh, well, this is a function of Q or epsilon Q. Um, when B is approaching zero, what happens is that this becomes a theta function, or better to say, a theta of mu minus epsilon q, because this quantity gets uh, uh, so let's find it down so e to epsilon q minus mu divided by k to t. So if epsilon q is larger than mu, this goes to plus infinity plus one. It's plus infinity, but it's in the denominator, so therefore it's zero. No? Whereas if epsilon q is smaller than mu, and then this becomes a, a, a large and negative number for t approaching zero, therefore this exponential goes to zero, and the function, the distribution function goes to one. Okay? So this function here becomes a theta function, so one over beta, Epsilon Q minus Q minus mu plus mu one becomes a set function mu minus epsilon Q when T is approaching zero. Okay. And we will work at least uh, in this case for today in the limit in which t is exactly zero. So this distribution function, it is exactly a step fun a heavy side function or step function, OK? Uh, so therefore, now, this uh, number density is equal to g divided by 2 pi cubed. Then I have this integral from 0 to plus infinity of the q to squared. And here, I just have this theta function. So, no, theta mu minus epsilon. That, that tells me that here, actually, this integral is not from zero to plus infinity, but I can determine a maximum of uh, um, Q which is the Fermi momentum that can be defined as follows. Okay. So this function uh, of, let me write it in a different way. So this two, two, d plus infinity of dq squared of theta of mu minus h squared, q squared divided by 2 and and that defines the Fermi momentum or Fermi wave number, which are the same. So mu equal to h squared, q squared divided by 2m allows to find, what sarà meglio considerare la variabile k? Vabbè, guarda. 
uh, from here I can derive that. Uh, yeah, let me let me change to the variable k. Come on. Okay. Uh, let me introduce uh, this quantity. So two m mu divided by h bar squared uh, and uh, m, yeah, square root. This defines a k actual, which is called Fermi magnitude. This is the first quantity. Therefore, this integral n is equal to g divided by 2 pi cubed integral from 0 to the maximum value of q, which is the Fermi momentum, which is kf, dq squared. And here, this data function is uh, uh, basically one because uh, I am restricting the integral from zero to kf, where this function is one, and then it is zero uh, above this quantity, you know? And so here, again, the density is uh, correlated with the Fermi momentum as uh, follows. Uh, io mi sto mangiando qualche fattore più greco, no? Yeah, I forgot to put Four pi, sorry. Four pi. And here I have a four pi, of course. Yeah. Uh, so this is G. And here I have a two pi squared. Two pi squared. And Fermi momentum cubed divided by three. Okay, yeah, cubed divided by three. Which is g k q uh, divided by six pi and this is density. Okay. So the density is provided already in terms of the Fermi momentum, and the Fermi momentum is basically provided by the chemical potential. Another quantity that is useful to introduce is the Fermi energy, which by definition is called Fermi energy. This is Q. Actually, this is the relation at T. And we will see that the relation between mu and the Fermi energy are not exactly the same when t is different from zero. But t equals zero, Fermi energy is equal to the chemical potential. Now, so which is the interpretation of uh, this fact, and then I will stop, is the fact that I'm occupying all the states from uh, k equals zero up to kf, uh, and that's it. And then after kf, I do not have any state okay so this is the Fermi sphere and the sphere in the kx k y k z uh, space or q uh, space uh, same the Fermi sphere is the one uh, for which uh, the k uh, is equal to um, here, no? Or if you want kx squared plus ky squared plus k squared, yes. it's fine, it's the sphere, no? All the levels here are occupied. Whereas outside the Fermi sphere, there is no occupation of the states. Sono uh, 58. Non mi sa che mi devo fermare qui perché non c'è tempo per andare avanti. Non devo fermarsi qua. So next time we will see. Uh, so now this is the density. 
uh, as a function the Fermi momentum or if you want the function of the chemical potential. Next time we will determine the pressure as a function of the Fermi momentum or chemical potential. We will see something that you might know, uh, namely the fact that uh, even if we are at zero temperature, we have a general, so called degeneracy pressure of fermions, which is due to the Pauli exclusion principle, which is a, uh, well, a very interesting phenomenon. And then we will go on and derive what is called the summer phase expansion uh, for, especially for computing the behavior of the entropy and the heat capacity uh, when T is small. Then we will finish. Salve a tutti, ci vediamo martedì. Grazie.